Hey everybody, it's Paul with Reporting Live from my sofa. How's it going today? Everything is going wonderful here. It is Tuesday, the time of this filming, and we are going to be continuing to review and comment on the Rosenbaum trial. Uh, we're going to be going over day four today, so that would be Monday's testimony, I believe it is. And there's a lot to cover in this. There's so many witnesses and so many layers. So without further ado, let's go ahead and review. So what I'm going to do is just kind of skim over each of these witnesses that I felt their testimony kind of spoke to me that was worth going over uh, and just talk a little bit about it. So let's go ahead and jump into it and we'll start off with the doctor that testified about examining Layla. And I just want to say a couple of things about that one. Uh, essentially what he's doing is establishing dates about what injuries were present, uh, especially the broken arm. Uh, and when he says that when he saw Lay when he saw Millie, he saw signs of abuse and he or she says she fell but the injuries weren't consistent with the fall and that kind of stuff we're going to see continue through some of this testimony with people like the neighbor and people of that nature where they're seeing these injuries and then here's the excuse that's given and it's not really adding up so let's continue on and get into the defects workers ebony taylor is a defects employee a program specialist and she established that the home eval was signed by someone that shouldn't have and that it did not go through the correct process and the defense tries to twist her words around and she says the home study wasn't done right because they didn't run Jennifer's maiden name. That they would, that if they did, they would have seen her CPS history and she would not have been approved. Now, again, we see this time and time again with, especially with these defects people getting up here because the defense is just trying to pick out one little piece of this and say, no, but she didn't do this. And, you know, and it's like, well, no, but there's something else majorly here. Like, you know, just like with this eval thing, you know, she's saying that this wasn't done all right together. She almost, the defense almost tries to turn it around on these people. Like, oh, it was your fault that somebody went around you to get around the system. I'm not trying to say people in this didn't drop the ball, but you can just see how the defense tries to twist their words around. And it's like, that's not what we're saying or doing. So it's very frustrating. Now, another one that got up there is Tamara Smith. She's another defects worker. Uh, and she supervised Samantha White, I believe it was. Uh, she did have concerns with her performance when it came to follow-up stuff. Uh, she says that Samantha listed the Ro Rosenbaums as fictive kin, which that to me sounds like because it's this whole scenario of of, well, she's my foster sister, and da 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 da. And Jennifer was able to like create this facade and smoke screen. It was like, okay, well, we'll just list you as this, and it's easier to kind of get in this way. You don't have to do the courses or whatever it is. Uh, and so that part, you know, was it was interesting. You see how the slipperiness takes place in this. Uh, now she also testified that a judge sent an email asking about when the placement would take place. So this is where, and one thing that was interesting overall about this day's testimony, we're going to see how Jennifer used this entire situation with her internship to kind of manipulate this process and skirt around certain protocol. Now, Mary Battle got up there and she works for the DA office as a district attorney. And I was like, oh my God, I'm dying to hear what this woman has to say. And she basically says that Jennifer did not go through the normal process process of getting her internship because they forgot about her, which I thought was very interesting. But essentially they were just like, okay, we're going to hire you. And they forgot and they already hired someone. And so they were like, well, we'll go ahead and hire her too, because you know, we basically feel bad. And isn't this an interesting thing of, we feel sorry for her. We feel bad that we see in this, you know, testimony throughout different people. I find it very interesting. And I don't know if she plays that sympathy card, but you know, anyways, so they had already picked someone out. They went ahead and hired her. And she said that she was a good intern. She was hungry for knowledge, wanted to learn, so on and so forth. So, I mean, she did say that. Now, one thing that I thought was interesting is that she claims, you know, I like Jennifer as a colleague, uh, a colleague type friend. You know, I could see the relationship forming like that, not like an outside friendship, but, you know, a, a colleague friendship. And, but then later she starts making these comments about, you know, first of all, we know that the DA has a daughter that has, uh, I'm, I can't remember the particular issues, but she has some type of developmental something going on. And so, and I think the daughter was like 21 or so. I mean, she's not a young child, uh, but you know, that her daughter was spending time with Jennifer and she was glad to see this is working out. 
uh, and then she talks about having lunch or doing this and that. So there's a little bit of this gray zone where I'm like, this sounds more than like a professional friendship. You know, this sounds like the, the lines are blurred a little bit here. It, so for me, my opinion, allegedly, I'm just like, okay, they weren't best friends. They weren't hanging out constantly, but they were more than just two coworkers that show up, you know, and it, there was definitely some, well, let me scratch your back a little bit to help you get this going. Now, also, you know, Mary was on the board uh, at DCF, DCAF. So you start adding these things in and it's like, okay, well, she says that basically she was like, whatever decision y'all are making, could you just try and hurry up and make it? Well, if somebody's on the board and a district attorney and this, that, and the other, you start to see how this got pushed through. You know, and you have judges and people of this nature. You see, you know, the good old boy system, but in here we'll call it the good old girl system, uh, how this is being pushed through to make things happen. Now, one thing that I thought was interesting is that she said that at one point Jennifer was called into the office and I can't remember his name, but it was like their ball, the, the main guy, I guess. Uh, Mr. I think it was Mr. White. I think that was his name. I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong. But basically, she was told on social media to quit making like these political posts that she was making. And even Mary Battle said, you know, I've never really had to do that before with somebody. But what was also interesting is that so she quit doing that. And then apparently she made another one months later. And so Mary called her or talked her on the phone or something. It was like, look, you know, you can't do that. And Jennifer was like, well, I'm not coming back in anyways. You know, and so basically it was just like, and I think it was almost like she was saying she wouldn't vote for who she was working for, something like that. But I mean, just interesting where I was like, really? So these people, and again, we only know part of the story and this, that, and the other, but it seems like Jennifer helped, or they helped Jennifer out. And I'm just like, really? You know, you're going to be like this, you know, you know, keyboard warrior apparently with your political stuff. And then when they're like, look, you can't do that. Well, never mind. I quit. I mean, really? After they took you in, it's kind of a sorrow case to begin with. Then... Whitley Kimball gets up on the stand. This is Jennifer's BFF. And, you know, here's my thing about her testimony. I felt like, A, she was completely uncomfortable in her own skin. I felt like she definitely had an attitude throughout the entire testimony, but it was way turned up in her dealings with the prosecution. Um, you know, if you were to sit here and say, well, who's, you know, the prosecution secured her as a witness for good reason, so they could control, like, what was being done or whatever, so that the defense could probably get in her ear. Regardless, I don't think that she made Jennifer look good because she was just, you know, that like scout. Again, when you start to look at who is directly associated with Jennifer, these are not nice people. This, this defense attorney is awful. Her attitude is awful wretched. And then her best friend gets up there and it's just like, ugh, they're just normal bumps and bruises. You know, and I'm just like, really? Okay, so that's interesting. That's nice. You know, just this, you know, whatever attitude towards the prosecutor, you know, and it's very clear her alliance is with her best friend. And I'm like, she doesn't seem, here's the end of the day, she doesn't seem objective. And so it's almost like wasted testimony because I'm just like, okay. And then she gets a little more perky with the defense and yes, ma'am. And a little bit more friendly and stuff, but it's just, you know, I'm sitting here and I'm like, a, a child is dead, you know, one that you somewhat had a, a relationship with, your best friend's kid, you know, do we need to act so flippant? So that was my whole thing with her. I've just felt like we could have done without her testimony. I don't think it helped Jennifer. If anything, I think it hurt her a little bit because again, you just look at how the people act that are directly associated with her and it's like, I don't believe a word that this woman's saying at all. I don't believe her, I'm sorry. Uh, let's see, Michelle Hall. This took the day for me. So she is a registered nurse. She is also one of the neighbors. And I was just like, she wasn't having it from the defense. She was not having it. Right off the bat, she's basically like, you know what? She, I guess she had met Jennifer when she was campaigning like for someone in the neighborhood or something. But I mean, they live near each other. Basically, she's at one point, Jennifer said uh, she, was raising she was raising her foster sister's kids because she was a meth head and karma's a real biatch. Uh, and now she was raising her kids. And I'm like, okay, again, this is allegedly we weren't there. But I'm just like, really? I mean, from what I've seen, like, I'm sure she, she's the type of person to say that. Who knows what happened with them way back when? I mean, we don't know. Um, but then, the, she, basically, she was like, uh, Michelle's like, I don't even want my daughter alone with her. She's like, you're not to be alone with her. Like, I get real bad energy off this situation. Like, that's just, you just don't say stuff like that. Uh, so there's that. Then 
basically the, to condense it, Jennifer comes over there one time with a child on her hip, says that she face planted uh, off a flight of stairs, and the nurse is saying, you know, okay, she has this bruising, raccooning as she calls it, and essentially she was like, in my experience, and the defense hated this, it was like, she's not an expert, da 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 you know, and so she had to say, in my experience, non-expert, as a nurse, you know, when we see this, the incident's already happened, this wasn't something that happened five minutes ago, she made it out like Jennifer was kind of making it out like it just happened and what I do and she was like the kid wasn't even upset and so basically she got on the phone with Choa I believe it is and on Jennifer's phone they had a speaker th phone call and again you start to see the ball drop where here's a nurse who's like uh you know in contact with the hospital and they're saying oh well she didn't knock herself out or it's a, a head injury you know take her in tomorrow and this that and the other because the neighbor said take her to the emergency room take her to the emergency room knowing that they would see the same thing and report this or whatever and so then here Choa is you know like uh oh, never mind it's okay uh says Jennifer never took the kid to the emergency room uh but the next time she saw her which was a few days later the eye bruising was gone and there was a new bruise on her head so I mean you start to see where you know the one thing that's frustrating is the defense and these people try and act like and like her best friend it's just normal bruises and I'm like I get kids are rough and tough and they get bruised up and stuff but there's a certain level where I'm like no this is not normal children don't get beat and battered on a daily basis like this with bruises and stuff. I mean, it just doesn't happen. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, and I, when I say beat and battered, I mean beating themselves up doing stuff. You know, there's just, it's just, that's not normal. So the defense starts pushing her in a corner, Michelle Hall, the nurse, the neighbor. And so she's like basically saying, like, how didn't she know that she got taken to the hospital, the child? And she's like, well, because Jennifer, she's going on what Jennifer said. And she's like, you know, well, I, I didn't say that. So unless you're saying Jennifer's a liar, then that's the only way we want to know. And it kind of shuts the defense up because it's true. It's, she's like, I didn't say this. These people that are calling the defense out on her tactics it's not doing any favors for the defense. She is twisting people's words around, putting words in their mouth, and everyone can see it. Y'all, the jury has to be sensing this. I mean, this is just a joke. And so then, another time, the defense says something to the effect of, you know, about an abuse, calling Jennifer an abuser, saying that Michelle called Jennifer an abuser. And Michelle goes, I didn't say she was an abuser. You said she was an abuser. And it literally just kind of, I mean, what can you say to that? And you could tell Michelle I was like oh Michelle's not having this she is not having this off of this woman you know and I mean do you blame her it's just it's very infuriating to watch so now the last person we're going to talk about is Peggy Banks that's the great-grandmother and again most of her testimony I didn't spend a whole bunch of time making you know notes on this testimony because it's kind of more of what we're seeing of establishing did this happen did that happen things that I thought were interesting that she brought out was the explanation of why these kids is going to stay with her. You know, she lived in a 55 plus community. Basically, when the girls were living with her at one point and the HOA found out, they were like, that can't happen. And so she had to say, okay, we all can't stay here. And, you know, it's a hard pill to swallow when what happened happened. Uh, now, essentially, after the, the death and whatnot, she went back to him and said, well, because y'all did this, look what happened. And they gave her like a two year level for Millie to come live with her and spend time. Uh, now, she said that she tried to keep up with the girls as much as possible, but essentially her health prevented her with some issues and age and things like that from really being able to like pick the girls up and do things like this. I can remember staying with my grandmother when I was young, and I don't know how young, young, but there was a certain point where it was like, I mean, my grandmother just wasn't that mobile. And actually, Peggy Banks kind of reminded me a lot, like, size and look and stuff of my grandmother. And it's just difficult for them to, you know, chase around after young kids. I mean, I got that part. I was like, oh, yeah. You know, two young kids like that, that's hard to keep up with. Um, you know, so I can understand that. It's still just heartbreaking to see what ended up happening, of course, but... Um, now, you know, she goes into, again, talking about how uh, we were also happy to see the Rosenbaums, you know, it looked good on paper, 
it, she said. Um, and then you start getting more in the details. And, like, w w basically when, like, Jennifer was doing the visitations and stuff, you start to see a huge thing that comes out with Peggy's testimony are all the little lies that Jennifer is telling. And when you start to see this weave, the, this web that she's weaving, I mean, this lie after lie after lie after lie after lie. Again, we weren't there. I, I wasn't there. We weren't there. Whatever. Allegedly, this is one person's testimony. But when uh, all these people's testimony, it makes adds up, except for, you know, Jennifer, well, Jennifer hasn't spoke, but what the defense is saying, and like, I'm going to go ahead and say the BFF, are, is a completely different story than what all these people surrounding this case are saying. Because all their stuff is pretty much the same, and you can connect the dots. But then, like, her BFF gets up there, and I'm like, no, this doesn't even make sense with what we've heard. And there's usually one of those in the crowd in the defense stuff. I mean, if you remember Tim Jones Jr. trial, a couple of those people are like, oh, he's the best. I'd let him watch my kids now. And, you know, I'm like, really? Um, so basically let's go back to the opening statements of the state of the prosecutor of the state uh, this is a facade that is what i took away from peggy banks uh, peggy banks testimony was this is a facade that they have created and you can see how it all adds up with little lies oh we're going to south dakota oh well, we had to do this oh well the girls can't go because of that now we need to cut visitation in half and you just see where it's like yeah the girls were probably had bruises to an extent where they couldn't be seen or whatever was happening they were just lying i mean who knows i mean you can't figure it out it is what it is so very interesting testimony. I, you know, I'm so ready to be... This trial, aside from being heart-wrenching and all that for the victims, this defense has gotten under my skin so bad, I literally almost am like, I don't want to watch it. I mean, when it's her turn to get up there, I cringe. You know, and I'm just like... I mean, you just feel like... Why do people talk to... Why on earth would you talk to people that way? She's trying to take this whole approach of, this is ridiculous, my client's even here. And I'm just like, have you looked at the evidence? Yeah, because the evidence doesn't look good at all. You can't get all these people together to create the same lie. You know, the evidence speaks to the truth. And the truth isn't looking good for the client. And she's making it ten times worse. So, I mean, Jennifer, Joe, so if y'all are watching, just take note your defense is like lining up a prison visit for you. <laughs> Which, you know, sorry to say, if you were hoping to get out of it, it ain't looking good. Do I think a good defense attorney would get them off of it? I don't think so. Uh, you know, so uh, maybe that's the whole thing. Like, eh, they're going to prison anyway. Let's just be as nasty as we can. I don't know. It's beyond me. And that's where we're going to wrap it up today. I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you for spending time with me. There are links in the description. Uh, we are doing, uh, we got a new podcast, so check that out because we talk about the things like Tim Jones Jr. trial. I'm covering this in the podcast with Henri's from Toxic Bliss. We have a very in-depth conversation about this stuff. It's uh, just another layer of interest. Uh, and there's lots of social media contacts in there to follow me on other platforms. I hope you are well. And I will see y'all later. Bye.